Okay, we're not, it's not going to be a poetry study, I promise. But, there, yeah, there's good stuff. We're only going to do four verses. But there's, actually, it'll take us technically through some more. But We'll just jump right in. Okay, so quick review. Uh, talking about the rhetorical nature of Hebrews before we jump in. Okay, so there was this whole ton of, in, you know, almost 2,000 years, ton of scholarship on the topic of the rhetorical methods used in the epistle to the Hebrews, uh, which is way beyond the scope of what we're going to try to do here. Other than to remember that whoever this author is, we think he's Clement or Luke, but whoever this author is, it doesn't matter, or God would have told us. Remember that this is a sermon, this is the only complete sermon manuscript that has come down to us as scripture. And it was intended to be read out loud in its entirety, those poor people, all 13 chapters. And we that was a long reading this morning. It's like, how about the whole book? The whole book, boom, into your ears at once. But then again, these hearers who are native Greek speakers would pick up on all the cool stuff that they're doing with the language, which I will not try to read it in Greek because it'll be a complete hash. Uh, but there's rhyme, there's alliteration where lines start with the same letter. Uh, there's word order moved in such a way so it flows off the tongue beautifully and then also emphasizes the points the author wants to emphasize. And that's, again, beyond the scope of what we're going to get into. But remember, this is something that's supposed to be read out loud and heard. Uh, and then there's just all kinds of things that are going to show you whoever this author is. He was well-educated in classical rhetoric. So in oration, so you think of, you know, some Roman fellow in a toga standing on top of, of the rostra, on top of the thank you, on top of the rostra, and get ready to speak to the people to get them to pass a bill that he wants in the government, and he would wax melodic and soothe everybody's ears with his fancy words. That's what this author is writing like. Okay, so it's it is a different kind of rhetoric than the classic type of rhetoric of giving a speech and writing a speech so you can remember it and recite it from memory and that the people could remember because it sticks in your brain. That was all part of it. But this is a new kind of rhetoric. This is liturgical rhetoric, rhetoric which is interesting. This is new, a new kind of discourse. So its form and its purpose is determined by its liturgical setting. Well, what do we mean by liturgical setting? They're reading it in church. So whatever part of the divine service, when they're gathered together, they are, and we're going to talk about what that was like, you know, they would hear the reading and then someone would give a sermon on it. Uh, but this is kind of, a, you know, this book is like the Bible study and sermon all in one. Uh, they would just read this out loud when it came in. And it will alternate between exposition of the Old Testament scriptures, because this author is going to be quoting the Old Testament like crazy. You'll notice most of the New Testament epistles, Peter's quoting the Old Testament. Jesus quoted the Psalms more than anything, but he quoted the Old Testament. They all did it. So this author of Hebrews is going to be quoting the Old Testament, and then he's going to be preaching about it. He's going to be explaining it. Uh, and it's going to alternate back and forth through that about quoting the Old Testament and then exhorting it. And then by the author's invitation of the hearers to you know, think about it, uh, they're going to become engaged in what we're going to have to use a fancy religious term or uh, academic term. We're going to call it advanced liturgical catechesis is what the author of the commentary called it. What is that? Okay, well, catechesis is nothing more than teaching the faith. That's where we get the word catechism. That's where you get confirmation, all those words. So catechesis just means being taught the faith, the basics of the faith. So liturgical catechesis is, well, I'm learning the basics of the faith by sitting in church, which our service does that too. You know, we have the different parts of the service, the readings, confession, absolution, hymns, which the hymns should connect some way to the readings that day, sometimes. 
And then the sermon should talk about something that you heard. And then the, the collect, the first prayer we have at the beginning, the gradual, the verse, which is just the first plucked out of the gospel usually, all those things connect together for the theme of the day, the theme of the season, and then the arc of the whole church year goes round and round. So that's liturgical catechesis. Every year we're going to hear the Christmas story. Every year we're going to hear the crucifixion story, the Easter story. Every year we're going to hear how the apostles went out at Pentecost and began the church. Peter gave that first sermon and all those people took it home with them. Every year we do this cycle, right? Every Advent we're anticipating Christmas. We're anticipating the baby Jesus for the 2000th time because we do this every year we go through that cycle. And every year we go through the cycle, we refresh our memories on the story of salvation that we've been taught. So that's what this fancy term liturgical catechesis does. And that's what this book does. Uh, and it will also, it also has two audiences. Uh, one audience, obviously they're sitting in church, is this audience of believers, but then you have the audience of those that maybe are getting wishy-washy, maybe, Maybe they're not that strong of faith. They're there, but they're kind of mm, on the fence. They're not sure what to make of this. Christianity is still new. Uh, so this author is going to warn them about what happens if they miss out on this. If they, if they miss out on the entry into God's place of rest, he will say. So it leads all of the hearers towards spiritual maturity, which is the goal of all worship. It's not only to offer our thanks and praise to God for what he's done for us, but he offers us his sacraments where he strengthens our faith, forgives our sins. But it also, as we get older, we get more mature in the faith. We understand a little bit more of how, what the Bible says. We understand a little bit more about what we're doing every Sunday. We understand the church here a little better. Uh, but most importantly, we understand that, yeah, I am a sinner. That's what true mature faith means, is you have no doubt you are a sinner. Uh, so what he's going to do, what this author is going to do, is he's going to point them right to the source. He's going to point them to the voice of God himself. That's who's going to be doing the speaking. But he's going to be doing it in the context of worship. And then the congregation will be exhorted also to participate in the service, you know, don't just be a lump on a, a lump on a board. Participate by coming to God in that assurance of faith, in that clear conscience, like we were talking about a moment ago, uh, which they're going to talk about clear conscience often. Uh, that assurance of faith in what Jesus has done for you and a clear conscience to come, worship, listen, repent, receive forgiveness. And Hebrews is going to use the word of God to do it. And by word of God, for them back then, this early, I mean, yeah, the, the, the gospels are being written, but most of the time when they talk about the word of God, they're talking about the Old Testament. That, that is scripture. And they were going to do that with a, a firm warning of the repercussions of leaving the faith, but it's going to encourage those who remain steadfast to keep their eyes on the promise of what awaits them in eternity. Uh, what awaits them in the world to come. And what they're gonna, he's going to do is he's going to draw imagery from Old Testament worship. So we're going to look at a lot of Old Testament worship things. And we're going to see how the author shows us. We talked about type last week. You know, so you have, uh, I need a good type. What's an easy type off the top of my head? Sn snake on a pole. So the bronze snake, right? That's a type of Christ. They looked to the bronze snake and they were healed of their snake bites. Just as we look back to the cross, our sins are forgiven. The snake on a pole was a little kind of foreshadowing of Christ, but Christ himself is so much bigger, so much more powerful. This author is gonna show us uh, how all of the old covenant worship actions are types of the bigger, greater worship actions that are happening now that have found their fulfillment in Christ's death and resurrection. Uh, so what God ordained in the tabernacle, we're gonna see the greater, better divine service in the new covenant uh, back then in their churches and in our churches today. 
And then we'll see some analogy going on from ritual in the Old Testament to the New Testament. Uh, it will show uh, what priests and people did in the Old Covenant, and then we'll see what, what, uh, how that serves to teach us what pastor and people, and actually Christ and people, because we're just servants, what Christ himself and the people do in the New Covenant, in the new worship, and why we do it. You know, what are we doing and why do we do it? So there's a lot of stuff that's going to go on. Um, structure of Hebrews, I'm not going to really get into that because you know, I don't think it's necessary at this point just yet. Uh, we can talk about outlines and all that good stuff, but I think it just is distracting at first. But we'll, we'll, we can come back to that. So because of the liturgical nature and the liturgical purpose of Hebrews, that this is a liturgical homily, a liturgical sermon, uh, we need to ask, what was church like in the first century? Uh, what was it like in a Roman home church? You know, when your religion is, is you know, still illegal and you've got to do it in secret, what was that like? Uh, and probably the best images we have of that, if they've ever done any kind of movie dramatization of people sneaking around to go worship or, or starting the the ichthys symbol and somebody else finishing it, the Jesus fish. You know, you draw half and the other guy draws half and you know you're both Christians, which they wouldn't figure that out quick, but I don't know. Uh, and that's what we know. That, that's all made up stuff because the truth is we don't exactly know. We don't have a liturgical handbook for what those services were like. But fortunately, if we do a drive-by on the book of Hebrews, we can get a picture of it. Maybe not in the order they do it, uh, but we will um, we'll see some things. Okay, so real quickly, if you've got your Hebrews on speed dial, look at Hebrews 13.7 uh, and 13.17. So think about... Look, liturgy, think about church service. So what does 13 tell us? 13.7 and 13.17 tell us. It's all the way in the last chapter. So 13.7 says, Remember those who led you, who spoke the word of God to you, and considering the result of their conduct, imitate their faith. And then 3.17 says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Uh, let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. So right away we know they have what? Strength. They, yes, they, they're being encouraged to have strength, but so who's encouraging them to have strength? Their leaders. Their leaders, which are their... Pastors, right? So they have, they have pastors who are, are their leaders. Uh, one, you know, they are appointing somebody to lead worship, and then everybody else becomes part of the congregation. It's kind of how it started. And that's really what we have today. I mean, I'm not anything special. I have a special office and a special role, but I'm not a special person. I'm just a person. I'm a sinner like you guys. But I have a different job. I've been called to do this vocation, Whereas you guys have all kinds of other different vocations too. We all do. So they appoint one to be their pastor and then they owe, they owe him. He is in, he's watching out for all of them. And then they in turn are, he's caring for them spiritually. And then they in turn are to uh, kind of listen to him unless he's teaching something false, just like Paul says. Okay. So they have a pastor. Then look at 3.1. Someone look at 3.1. Someone look at 4.14. And I'll look at 10.23. Who's got 3.1? We've got 4.14. Okay, 4.14. Unless you want 3.1, I got that too. Oh, good. 3.1? Go ahead. All right, therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, Consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession. Okay. That was four, right? Was that four? No. That, that was three? three. What's 414? Okay. 
Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. Okay, and then 1023 says, let us hold fast the confession, sensing a theme here. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised it is faithful. Okay, so, and this one's a little on the obscure side, but they have like the beginnings of a creed. You know, they have a confession of faith. So they're confessing that Jesus is the Christ, that he is God's son and that he is their Lord. You know, and that they are following him, not whoever they pick to be pastor to be their spiritual caregiver. That's his job, that's his role, but ultimately who they're following is Christ. Christ is their head. And you'll see that like in Paul's letter to the Corinthians, that chapter is where it talks about, you know, you know I, oh, I say I follow Apollos and others say Paul. You know, they're getting caught up in who their pastor was, who taught them rather than what they were being taught. So they were getting little groups, right? And Paul just says, hey, I chose, I'm glad I never baptized any of you because I chose to know nothing among you but Christ and him crucified. Okay, now someone look at 2, 11, and 12. Anybody got that one? Yeah, 11. Okay. Both the, <laughs> try again. Both the one. Both the one who through suffering. I'll try again. Both the one whose suffering makes men holy, and those who are also are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers. Okay, next verse two. Okay. Saying. Oh, 12. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he he says, I will declare your name to my brothers in the presence of the congregation. I will sing your praises. Okay. So that is, of course, talking about Jesus and quoting Jesus as saying a psalm. That's Psalm 22. Was it 22? 22. So we have psalms. We have hymns of thanksgiving. Uh, we have presentations of hymns and psalms as a thank offering. And we'll talk about, when we get into it, we'll talk about what thank offerings were in the Old Covenant. And then that's kind of our equivalent today. That's what we have for, we don't, you know, uh, we don't offer like grain and fruit for a thank offering. Uh, we offer our hymns of praise and our actual offering offering for that matter. Okay, and let's look at 13.22. Brothers, I urge you to bear with my word of exhortation, for I have written you only a short letter. Okay. So, now in this case, this is the writer of the... Hebrews that's speaking and remember what he's speaking is a sermon so this is the pastor's exposition that's what sermons are exposition of scripture this is the pastor's exposition and application of scripture to these people's lives because he's getting to the end this is toward the end he's wrapping it up this is where you give him the gospel right so he's like that last urging I urge you Bear with this word because I've only written to you briefly, but you know, take it to heart, take it home. Yeah, it's a word of encouragement to the congregation. And then I won't make you look up 1316. It just says, uh, do not neglect doing good and sharing for with such sacrifices God is pleased. Offering. Okay, so that's the offering. And then we also have uh, 416. Who's got 416? Let us therefore draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and may find grace to help in time of need. Okay. 
And then I'll read 725, which says, uh, Therefore he is able also to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. So whenever we hear that word intercession or uh, 416 they used, you know, drawing near with confidence to the throne of grace, that's talking about prayer. So that's encouragement to pray. Pray for yourselves and pray for others. So they have prayer, just like we do. They're not that different from us. Uh, and then let's see, 13, 9 to 12. Ah, better put eight. Put eight with it. That's probably the most famous verse in Hebrews. So 13, 8 to 12. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods which have not benefited those devoted to them. Would you want through 12? Oh, 13. 13. We have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy place by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin and burned outside the camp. So Jesus also suffered suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. Okay. And that is talking about the Lord's Supper. A little obscured because they're talking about the old the old covenant sacrificial system. So the analogy is going to go directly to Christ as the ultimate atoning sacrifice. And well, again, I'm going through this part really fast, so don't worry too much about it. But it's just to illustrate, look at all the parts of the liturgy that this author is talking about. So it's like he's giving a sermon on, on the church, basically, or, or what the life what the worship life of the church should be. If he had to pick a theme, maybe that would be a good theme for what this sermon's about. Uh, and then it, you know, and then it comes to its conclusion, just like a church service does. You know, it goes to thirteen twenty, and says, "Now the God of peace, who brought up the dead, the great Shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, equip you in every good thing to do His will." That's a benediction. That's the Lord bless you and keep you in different words. And then 21, the very end, there's a doxology uh, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. <coughs> uh, which is kind of what our final hymn sort of is. But that's pushing a little bit. But there's that, you know, give ultimately all this stuff. The Lord bless you and keep you in the name of Christ. Now go home. The service is over. <laughs> okay, so man, again, the sermon was intended to be read aloud in the context of the divine service. So this stuff's going to be very obvious to the people who are hearing it. It's a little weird to us. Uh, and then you can look at, oh, I'm going to branch out a little bit here. If we look at, what did I say? Acts 20. Then this is just to give you a little more background about worship in this time frame. So in Acts chapter 20, verse 7, on the first day of the week when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul began talking to them, intending to leave the next day, and he prolonged his message until midnight. And there were many laps in the other room where we were gathered together. And there was a young name, man named Eutychus sitting on the windowsill, sinking into deep sleep. And as Paul kept talking, he fell out the window and died. But then Paul raised him from the dead. Spoiler, sorry. Uh, but yeah, so, it's Paul. So yeah, we were gathered together to break bread. That's the house church. That's what they're doing. Uh, and Paul started sermonizing and he kept going. So 
Paul's Pastor Fred. <laughs> Forty minute sermon the other Sunday. I know. I listen. I haven't listened to it while I'm doing something else. It's like he's still going, but it's good stuff. Who's it? Pastor Freddie up at Light Across. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, he's not preaching so much as he's just talking to everybody. Yeah. But it's just his way. So it's like you don't realize forty minutes went by until you went. That was a forty minute sermon. <laughs> wow. No. Uh, and then if we look at 1 Corinthians 14.26, there's just little, little, uh, little hints of what it was like. It's scattered here and there, but that's really all we know, unfortunately. Uh, what is the outcome then, brethren, when you assemble? Each one has a psalm, has a teaching, has a revelation, has a tongue, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. If anyone speaks in a tongue, it should be by two or at the most three in each in turn, and one must interpret. But if there is no interpreter, he's supposed to keep his mouth shut. Uh, I'm not going to get into charismatic stuff. Uh, other than suffice to say, there might have been two or three sermons, two or three expositions of, of texts. And it was the other verse, and that's probably the last one I've got here, that it said, uh, so they would read uh, as much as they had time for. So they might read a whole book. They might only have time for a chapter. It depends how much time they had to do this. Uh, yeah, and then he you know, also says, therefore, when you meet together, it's not to eat the Lord's Supper because each one takes his own supper first. One is hungry, one is drunk. He was talking about things they were doing. It's like, guys, this is supposed to be worship. This isn't, you know, the corner tavern getting bar food, like clean it up. Uh, so in the beginning, they had some issues, but they would read what they had time for and then they would, you know, move on. So a couple hypothetical questions uh, because it does come up often uh, so was it a charismatic service where gifts of the spirit were distributed and utilized people want to say um, and I would say yes with an asterisk as they heard the story of their salvation and shared the Lord's Supper they received the Holy Spirit and his innumerable gifts which they would then go out into the world to uh, and act in their vocations. Uh, so yeah, we do have that example of people speaking in tongues and somebody has to be there to interpret it. Uh, once you get out of the apostolic first generation church, that all goes away. Because once the apostles are gone, nobody has that gift that we know of. They may still have it. I won't say they don't have it today, but uh, let's see. Was it a service of prayer and praise? Yeah, Absolutely. You know, absolutely in connection with, again, hearing the word and eating the body and blood of Christ in the Lord's Supper. That is their ser service of prayer and praise and receiving the gifts. Uh, and that there was their service of the word like ours. Was there, they would take readings from the Septuagint, that's the Greek translation of the Old Testament, which is older than the oldest Hebrew translations they had. Uh, and they would exposit from that, uh, just like in the Greek-speaking synagogues. So the Jews of the diaspora, wherever they were, they would go to temple, they would hear the scriptures in Greek, because they're native Greek speakers, they couldn't read Hebrew anymore, a lot of them. Uh, they would hear it, they would expound on it, and that's what the early church was like too. It's modeled right after, again, those Old Testament um, rituals, the Old Testament worship, and then the modern-day synagogue practices, and then the early Christian church. Well, of course, it's going to be modeled right after that. Uh, I maybe smell a little bit too much time on that stuff, but again, that's that's just kind of a shotgun. Boom, here's all the parts of the liturgy that's in this book, so we're going to cover worship practices, that's what this author is going to be talking about. He's going to use it as a framework to teach us what he has to teach us. Okay, we're actually ready to start Hebrews now. All right, so we're going to do Hebrews 1, verses 1 through 4. I'm going to read 
uh, Dr. Kleinig's translation, which is the unpacked version. Uh, it might have a couple weird words in it, so follow along in your translation. And because uh, there's a couple key phrases I like to talk about. So Hebrews 1, 1 to 4. After formerly speaking in many parts and many ways to the fathers by the prophets, in the last of these days, God has spoken to us by the one who is son, who is, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also made the ages, who being the radiance of his glory and the exact imprint of his substance, and sustaining all things by his utterance of power, having made purification for sins, sat down at the right hand of God, the majesty in the heavenly heights, having become so much better than the angels as the name that he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. And the reason I read that translation is because it's a lot more flowery than our translations are. And that's to give you an idea of, if you read this in Greek, what it sounds like. It, it's it, like it's it's heavy duty Greek. I mean, they the one I have one commentary. It's nothing but a commentary on the Greek, and he goes on for like forty pages about at least four verses. Yeah, forty pages. That's how much he had to say about it. So again, so these first four verses are one long. Beautifully constructed sentence in Greek. And it was designed to give you a beautiful listening experience. You're going to hear that. And if you're a native Greek speaker, you're going to be like, ah, yeah, that's really good. This is good. This is good. It's pleasing to the ear. Uh, it uses uh, alliteration, rhythm, cadence, balance, and contrast. It varies up the word order and makes significant emphases. Uh, and again, the author does not identify himself. So, uh, question, I think, that kind of gave the answer away. So what is different about the way this epistle begins than just about any of the other ones? No greeting. Yeah, no greeting. There is no salutation. There is no, no I, Paul, a servant of Christ, and, and our brother Timothy, from our brother Timothy, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, it just starts right off with who? Who is speaking? Yeah, the author is speaking, but who? who's the actual speaker? Who's it about? It's about Jesus and his place, right? Eventually. God's character. Eventually. So after formerly speaking in many parts and many ways to the fathers by the prophets, in the last of these days, God has spoken to us by. So who's the first actor? God, the Father. Okay? It doesn't say the Father, but it's God the Father. So instead of putting the focus on the letter writer, the focus is immediately on God the Father, not Christ yet, on God the Father. Okay? And it talks because this is going to build that, that dynamic that we're going to see of going to the Old Testament and the Old Covenant and then coming forward to Christ and comparing the two and how what Christ has done is so much greater than what happened under the Old Covenant. Uh, so the emphasis is on God, the Father, the actor, because he's the actor throughout. Okay? So... The emphasis is on the voice of God, the word of God. Okay, the speaker of that word past and present, God. And we will look at, as we go forward, uh, we will look at the way those Old Testament references are expounded on and how those events in the Old Testament affected God's people in the Old Testament as well as how they apply to the people here who are hearing it, and of course how they apply to us, because they have to, excuse me, apply to us the same way. And then you'll see already that beginning, the way the author has constructed this phrase is really cool. So, you know, again, we're gonna have that theme. Things happened in the Old Covenant, and they were good. But then when Christ came, everything was fulfilled, perfect. And you're already getting that flavor 
with this really cool word in many parts and pieces. You know, after formally speaking in many parts and many ways, that's one word, uh, parts and pieces. And it talks about, so how did God speak to the prophets? A little bit at a time. Nobody got the full picture. God was still hidden. The, the picture of what is salvation going to look like? Yeah, the Messiah is going to come. We don't know what that looks like. We don't know what's going to happen. I mean, it's there in the prophecies, but it's, it's here and it's there. It's in pieces. So God revealed to us through the prophets, through the fathers, the previous generations, in pieces, in parts. But in these last days, in these last days, he has spoken to us in his son. So now the final revelation, the final revealing of God's plan is revealed in Christ. And then he's the last speaker. He's the last prophet. Christ speaks. He is the speaker. He's the one who created. And we're even going to see that. So God revealed a little bit here and a little bit there and a little pieces, parts there. But then in these days, these last days, he has revealed everything to us through his son. And then he tells us why. Okay, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also made the ages. So he not only inherits all the things of the Father, but he is also the one who created everything with the Father. So without God divulging everything at once because this fragmentary revelation and the it just highlights how you had all this parallel revelation and then it's full revelation in the Son. Uh, so you had formerly in many parts in many ways and then in these last days. And then there's this parallel construction that goes on. So we have after speaking, and then God has spoken to the fathers, to us, and then by the prophets, by the one who is son. So you have these parallels, boom, 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 the old and the new, old and the new, old and the new. And again, this way this introduction is constructed to carry you through history, the emphasis is upon the speaker, the speaker being God. And then the next most emphatic uh, figure in the text is, the, of course, the son, who takes his place, his rightful place at the right hand of the father. Okay, and I'm going to unpack some of that some more. So if we look at the, like the outline of just these first four verses, and I'm not going to do this every week, I promise, but it's just really interesting how much is packed in these four verses. That, that sets the stage for, for what's getting ready to happen. Because you, you had to hit these people in the ears, and they would have sat up and went, mm, this is good, this is good. And that's kind of what Luke did. Uh, as an aside, like for example, Luke, again, well-educated, well-versed in Greek, probably of Jewish origin, so he understands both sides of the culture. And then when he wrote his gospel, he didn't necessarily write things in sequential order. He wrote them in the order of a narrative, which didn't contradict anything. It's okay to do that. You know, he would never say, oh, well, first Jesus did this. He would go, as was Jesus' custom, he did this. And he puts that story first. He goes, oh, he's done this before, but we're going to focus on what happened this day in the synagogue. Boom. And he's going to tell the story. And he does it in this beautiful Greek in the way an epic story would have been told, like Homer and the Iliad type of stuff, big epic uh, storytelling, because his Greek audience loved that stuff, and that would have, boom, oh, hey, he, this guy's orating, you know, like, like a true storyteller. Let's listen to the story, because obviously this guy's got a good story to tell. Listen, listen to his beautiful Greek, boom, and he's got him, and then he's telling them the story. So that's like how Luke was done. Now in this one, Again, it's going to focus us on the Father, and it's going to do that by really nailing it home that the speaker is God, the one doing all this work is God, and look how beautiful it is. So God speaks to his people. How does he speak to his people? 
He speaks through the prophets. And now he speaks, has spoken through his son. So, okay, what's the relationship of, of God to the son? Well, the son is appointed as his heir. And God's created the ages through his son. So that tells us how he can be enthroned as, because he's God, we know that. But, okay, the son can be enthroned at the right hand of God because he has these credentials. He is the son, the one in whom he is well pleased, the one who fulfilled all things. So now that he has done that, he has the nature of son, the nature of power, sustaining the universe, and his performance of his mission. He succeeded. He defeated sin, death, and the devil for all time, for all people. And because he completed that mission, he now sits at the right hand of the throne of God. Remember, some people didn't think he was God yet. I mean, that had to sink in. This man rose from the dead and ascended into heaven because he's God, not because he was a special prophet. So it's showing, you know, yes, he was a man. Yes, he did these things, but he's also God. And that is why he could go up and sit at the right hand of God. He was no mere man. Okay? So his, his power in sustaining the universe, and then he comes to earth, and his power in defeating sin and death. So now he can sit at the right hand of God, and he is elevated above angels because people love angels. It's like, well, his rank is higher than the angels, and his name is superior to any angel. You know, he is the heir of all things. Uh, this theme of inheriting, you know, inheriting the right to sit at the right hand of the Father. This idea of inheritance is going to be another theme that we're going to come back to again and again. Uh, just to shotgun you with it, uh, Hebrews 1.14, 6.12, 6.17, 9.15, 11.7 to 8, 12, 17. Inheritance comes up again and again and again. Okay. Uh, and this cool word, uh, this word name, should I just go in order? I feel like I'm going too fast now. Am I going too fast now? Okay. I'm starting to get into the Old Testament uh, references that have already happened in these four verses. Uh, the sun sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Look at Psalm 110.1. So the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. And this is a direct, uh, direct reference to that. And it will also happen again. And then we have these active verbs, being, bearing, having, all leads to that verse four, having become. It also goes to uh, that Psalm 110.1. Uh, and that becomes uh, uh, one of the keys to the structure of Hebrews. Again, this, this inheritance, this having been given, uh, the Lord saying to my Lord, have this seat at my right hand, the most high seat, you know, at the feast. That is, that's the seat of honor. Uh, so he inherited the superior name, uh, and then the word majesty. The word majesty used here, it's, a, it's kind of a fun word in Greek. It's megalosyne. Uh, sounds cool, megalosyne. It, it's used two places here in 1.3 and in 8.1, and it's in Jude 25. That's the only time you see that word in the New Testament. But in the Septuagint, in the Greek Old Testament, it's used nine times. And it's always connected to the name of God. So, uh, yeah, Onoma is just the name, name, but this majesty, and it's not like quite a direct translation. You know, Megalosyne, it does have that majestic sound to it. Anytime the word mega is in there, it means big. So this majesty, Megalosyne, uh, it's always, always connected to the name of God. So it's 
you know, the divine majesty, the name of majesty, the seat of majesty. Uh, and that is the superior name. Because you notice he's referred to as the son, the son, the son, the son. Uh, so what's the superior name? Is the superior name the son, the son of God? Is, he, is that the superior name? He has no. We know he's the son. The son did these things, and now uh, the father gives him a title, a majestic title of honor for having accomplished all things. And that, that title of honor is majesty. You know, king. You know, the, this uh, king language. And it's an honor bestowed only to the son. So the, the superior name is not that he's the son of God. The superior name is the father calls him, you know, the majesty, the king. He crowns him king. Uh, and you can look at the way the honor is bestowed in the Old Testament. If you want to. Uh, Deuteronomy 32.3. Uh, Deuteronomy 32.3 For I proclaim the name of the Lord ascribe greatness to our God. It's in the Psalm, Song of Moses. The rock, his work is perfect for all his ways are just. And then first crown, there's a bunch in first chronicles. There's a lot. Of, uh, Proverbs 18.10 is the easiest one to find. Proverbs 18.10 is the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runs into it and is safe. Okay, and then First Chronicles. First Chronicles 17, 19 to 21. Okay, so First Chronicles 17, 19 to 21 says, uh, O Lord, for your servant's sake and according to your own heart, you have wrought all this greatness to make known all these great things. O oh Lord, there is none like you, nor is there any God beside you. You, according to all that we have heard with our ears. Uh, and just talking about that, the greatness of his name, the Lord's name. And I could probably do this part better because I think I lost something somewhere. But... Uh, and then Sirach 39.15, go into the Apocrypha a minute. Uh, Sirach 39.15 says, and that's Ecclesiasticus in some of your Bibles if you have the Apocrypha, magnify his name, show forth his praise with the songs of your lips, and with harps and in praising him you shall say after this manner, all the works of the Lord are exceeding good, and whatever he commandeth shall be accomplished in due season. And none may say, what is this? Wherefore is that? For at time convenient, they shall all be sought out. Uh, and that's, again, use of that word great. That's that same word in Greek. So this majesty, mighty, the right hand, it's all of those things. And then, this is just kind of an aside, I'm not going to get into it, unless you want to sometime. That would be a Bible study on it in of itself. But then what comes next after these four verses, which you can study on your own if you want. There, I mean, you look from like verse 5 on the rest of the chapter, everything's indented, right? Because it's poetry, because it's quoted. It's all out of the Old Testament. So, they call this the string of pearls. And it could be because... Is that the five Ps? Hmm? The five Ps? What's that? I don't But uh, yeah, this is the string of pearls because it's just all these pearls of Old Testament uh, prayer that come out. You know, you are my son to give. Forgotten me. I will be a father to him. He should be a son to me. Let the angels of God worship him. Who makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire? I mean, there's all kinds of stuff here you can unpack. 
Uh, and where those come from is, uh, first off, it's in 2 Samuel uh, 7.14. 1 Chronicles chapter 17, 2 Samuel chapter 17, and then the book of Odes. What's the book of Odes? I had to look that one up. It's like book of Odes. Can you repeat those? The last couple. Sure. Uh, 2, Samuel, 2 Samuel 7, 14, and 2 Samuel 17, 26, and 1 Chronicles 17, basically the chapter, but okay. 17, 8. Uh, the Book of Odes is a book that is only now found in the Bibles in the Eastern Orthodox Church. Or if you have a critical edition of the Septuagint in English, it's in there. Uh, and it's the basis of everybody's liturgy. So all of your, like Matins, comes right out of it. But it turns out the Book of Odes just copies stuff from all over the place. So there's, it's actually, it's got the first Ode of Moses, which is Exodus, second Ode of Moses, Deuteronomy, the prayer of Anna, the prayer of Habakkuk, the prayer of Isaiah, the prayer of Jonah. And then there's the prayer of Azariah and the song of the three young men that's right out of the Apocrypha. That's from the Apocryphal portion of Daniel. Uh, actually, the prayer of, Az Az prayer of Azariah is part of the song of the three young, or it's called the, the song of the three holy children. So if you have Apocrypha, a recent Apocrypha in English, both of those, the prayer of the three young men and the prayer of Az Azaria is one little book. It's like two pages. And then the, Mag the Magnificat. So all those Old Testament canticles, basically, is in this book called the Book of Odes. And then they use that, and it's the basis of Matins and all kinds of other uh, uh divine offices or uh, liturgies. So they just took this book and they quoted all the best parts and made it another book. And, and it actually, that book is boom in the Eastern Orthodox Bibles, which is kind of neat. Okay, so that was all a ton of stuff all at once that I kind of shotgunned at you. So. In my Bible, there was a Reference to First Peter one seventeen. Okay. I mean, it was Matt Majestic, um, and it got, got me into a little bit of a rabbit trail. Yeah, I could do Not, that. I was paying total attention to what you were saying. It's just. <laughs> oh yeah, I love doing that. And I think the First Peter. I think that's a different word of Majesty. Oh, I, that's what I was going to ask you. Yeah, let's because see. It's, um, Second Peter. Second Peter. Second Peter. What? Um. Oh, what did I do? Did I mess it up? Oops, too far. I think, did I make it wrong? Was it first year? Okay. No, it was second year. Second, second Peter? Peter 117. Second. So when he received honor and glory from God the Father, such an utterance as this was made to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved son with whom I am all pleased. That was one seventeen? Second, second Peter. I'm second sorry. second Peter one seventeen? Mm -hmm. Is that the same majestic? Maybe it's a totally different translation. <coughs> It is the same root. I was just wondering, has anyone? No, ever, that's yeah, that's the same root. It's the same word. Has anyone ever thought of Peter maybe writing Hebrews? No, <laughs> yeah, he didn't come up. Why? I don't know. Because when when you've been given the gift of the Holy Spirit, he can enable, and he's been hanging around so many intelligent people. Sure. And he'd been traveling with Jesus, who was. The author of all wonderful sure. language. I mean, no, that he hasn't. He doesn't come up in any speculation for being the author. Hmm. Uh, why that is, I, because I do know with with inspiration, he God still allows the personality 
and the background of the author, the human author, to come through uh, and give it personality. And you just, it just doesn't read like Peter. But wasn't he the head of the church back then? Yeah, he was the first among equals, yeah. Yeah, Jesus and groomed him. He had the most burden to make sure that everyone was. Probably didn't have time to write, honestly. He may, he may not have had time to write, is what I always thought, because he only has like these two these two short epistles, but technically, Mark's gospel is Peter's. John Mark was the companion of Peter. So really, John Mark, you know, that we talked about at the, at the, uh, the criteria for being included in the canon. You, you know, you had to be with them from the beginning. So John Mark would have been with them from the beginning, but he palled around with, with Peter. So Peter's telling him all this stuff, and John... Mark is writing it, writing it down. So it's filtered through John Mark's eyes, but it's Peter's words, really. Okay. I mean, just like when you read Luke, yeah, Luke is 100% the Holy Spirit working through Luke and his, his diction and his beautiful grammar. But that's Paul. <laughs> you know, that's, he palled around with Paul on all his missionary journeys. So, oh, okay. you know, so he's getting the stuff firsthand from, from Paul, but then he also is going around and goes, well, I figure it's a good idea to go check my sources. So mm-hmm. how do we know what Mary said when she sang the Magnificat? He went and asked her. She's still alive. So that's how that worked. Oh. Yeah, so really when you think of Luke, it's really it's Paul's gospel. And when you think of Mark, it's Peter's gospel. Okay. So then there's a little more. Thank you. Yeah, it's kind of like all the stuff we have that we say, oh, you know, Luther wrote. Well, yeah, he said it and somebody wrote it down because they hung on his every word at dinner. But otherwise, we wouldn't have had a lot of that stuff. So, so yeah, he, he wrote it, but he didn't write it, you know? It's interesting, though, isn't it? I think so. Yeah. And so I will... I'm going to wrap it up here with a couple of comments, and then I'll let you guys do more talking like next time. I promised I wasn't going to do that, but there was a lot of background stuff still to go through. So I'm just going to drop a couple nuggets that I thought was cool. Uh, how we have these measured contrasts, I think, is something that we're going to want to continue to pay attention to. You know, you have a God who's spoken before, but now he speaks again in a new and final and complete way. Uh, you know, again, how we're drawn to pay attention to the words of God, not whoever this author is. Uh, and that the son is the one who continues to speak to us even now. So, you know, in these last days, I guess we got to talk about the these last days. It's kind of loaded. People, well, what, what does that mean? It depends on what you mean by days, where you're reading days. OK, so. When you see days in scripture, it often is referring to the seven days of creation. Um, Sometimes it means the consummation of the ages, especially when you talk about the seventh day. Um, That means the the consummation of the ages. It's a figure of speech. Uh, It shows up in 926. Uh, And in this particular context, when it says in these last days, that's what it means when he says days here. So it's the consummation of the ages. You know, Jesus has finished all things. So we're waiting for him to return. Uh, and then there's another meaning that doesn't probably, most likely does not mean that here. Uh, but they have this idea of the eighth day, which marks the beginning of a new world. So sometimes they'll talk about the eighth day, which is really just the first day after seven days. It's the first day again, the first day of the week again. Uh, so the first day of the week and the eighth day is the same thing. The Lord's Day, uh, but that is usually used to mark the beginning of another world. There's a there's a pseudepigraphal gospel called Barnabas, uh, not to be confused with Barnabas's epistle, or there's another thing. Barnabas is something or other. He wrote something else that they named after Barnabas. Barnabas didn't write it, but what that gospel is, it's a false gospel. Uh, it is the Islamized, 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 is. Sounds right, Islamized. Islamized. And I think that's how you said it. So it's the Ismal. Is, it's the. 
can't even make fun of it because I can't get the word out. Yeah, so it's the Muslimized, there we go, it's the Muslimized version of the gospel almost. It appeared after Muhammad came on the scene and started doing his thing. Uh, so they wrote this, and it's like they sanitized the gospel accounts and wrote this false gospel so that it would jive with everything the Quran says. So if you ever get a chance to read it, you can read it. Don't read it too close because it's like, this is kind of like the Bible, but it's not. It's amazing how we have all those, these books like that out there. Some of them are cool to read, but... Oh, and I said I could have done this part better. I did do it better like three pages later. So we'll, I'll, we'll revisit that next week. But uh, and we're going to have this idea of cleansing and purifying, which again goes back to the cleansing and purifying in Leviticus, and then the purification for sins, uh, which is how that this beginning part ended, didn't it? No, I skipped ahead. Yeah, we'll get to that. Okay. So yeah, that's where I'm probably going to stop tonight. Uh, you know, where we we'll talk about you know the thing to keep in mind is the son is the one that continues to speak to us even now. His blood speaks the better word, and that phrase comes up. Uh, his blood speaks the better word, and it makes those sprinkled by it holy. That's going to come up often uh, in this. And then again, how uh, remarkably God uses human beings to speak his word now in worship. Uh, and then through those speakers, you know, the, the Holy Spirit works and uh, those words go into us and do, do the work that they say they do. Uh, and that, that's a good place to stop. That is interesting that that's because none of my notes said anything about Second Peter having that same word. I wouldn't even thought to look there. But, that, but it is it, it is the same word. It was in my NAS. It was just. Um, yeah, it's the same word. To the in my verse three, it gave us to look over at. Yeah, Second Peter 1.17. Huh, mine does too. <laughs> about that, it's right there. Okay. Anyway. So that's where we'll stop, and then we will we will talk about more about the radiance of glory, his excellent name, uh, the exact imprint of his substance. We'll get into that because uh, that's another fun Greek word. It's called hypostasis, uh, which doesn't really translate perfectly, but it, it literally means being of the same substance. It basically, means you're made of the same stuff. Uh, we'll talk about the consecrating of the altar. And uh, we will talk about the holy work done in the tabernacle and cleansing. We will talk about cleansing at length. Uh, so we will get into our Old Testament as well next week because that's still on these first four verses. Uh, and then we'll move on. We'll move on. So the last thing, the last, last thing I want to share with you. So this is from the large catechism of uh, Dr. Luther. Uh, in the section about the Apostles' Creed, uh, based on these verses out of Hebrews. And Luther says, God himself has revealed and opened to us the most profound depths of his fatherly heart, his sheer unutterable love. He created for us this very purpose to redeem and sanctify us. We could never come to re recognize the Father's favor and grace were it not for the Lord Christ, who is a mirror of the Father's heart. So that's, Luther had a way with words. That's one of the really good ones where it's just like, yeah, that, that, I see that. That's what that says. I couldn't have put it like that, poetically like that. But uh, yeah, he had a gift for simple, making hard concepts simple. But yeah, that was in right in the, the large catechism. So when, when Jesus speaks to us, we're hearing the gracious voice of God and we're by hearing we see the hidden glory of God. The, God. the glory, we're not allowed to see that, but we start to see it through what we hear Christ speak to us.